Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's LINK webinar. This is part of our ongoing series of live and recorded weekly webinars detailing Teledyne Marine's products and applications. Uh, we hope this finds everyone doing well and uh, hopefully having survived at least phase one of the U.S. elections that appear to never end. The fun continues. Uh, before we get started, I do have a, just a couple of quick housekeeping items for you today. So uh, number one, today's presentation is it will be recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the recording within 48 hours. So um, you'll have that to download and share if you like. Uh, also, due to the large number of attendees, everyone is going to be muted. Uh, you are in listen-only mode. However, we do encourage you to type in and submit any questions that you have as we go along, and then we'll be happy to address all of those at the end. So moving on, uh, we're very pleased to share today's topic with you. It's given by our guest presenter, Dr. Richard Daly from Nobacy. Uh, which now includes BEMCO. Some of you may uh, be familiar with BEMCO. It's now part of the larger Inovacy organization. Uh, this organization has sold hundreds of Teledyne Benthos uh, acoustic modems to deliver the ACOMs for their BR4 underwater modem, uh, which is used for fish and marine mammal tracking programs. A little bit more about Dr. Valley before we get started. He's a very impressive individual. We were just chatting before we got started here. Uh, Dr. Richard Valley is a Vice President of Sales for Inovacy's Fish Tracking Division, specializes in developing studies for tracking wild fish stocks in both marine and freshwater ecosystems using acoustic telemetry solutions. Richard has over 30 years experiencing, experience developing embedded system solutions and holds degrees in physics, electrical engineering, and business, and he actually has five degrees, which I was very impressed with. So I think we're in good hands today with the, with this presentation and a very knowledgeable speaker. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to you, Dr. Valley. Great. Uh, thank you, Margo. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here as well. I uh, really appreciate that. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining my talk today that will focus, uh, as Margo says, on fish tracking using acoustic telemetry. Uh, Novacy is focused on developing products and services for the sustainable use of our aquatic resources. And in my case, I'm predominantly involved with uh, researchers interested in gaining knowledge for the sustainable use of wild, uh, wild fish stocks. So the technology really uh, that we've developed focuses on tracking fish, individual fish using acoustic uh, telemetry. And we've been doing this now for nearly four decades. So the idea is you uh, attach a tag to an animal, uh, the tag transmits acoustic power, and in that information is the ID of the animal as well as potentially some sensors, pressure sensors, temperature sensors, that sort of thing. Those transmissions are picked up by acoustic receivers, and so then you know whether what individual was in the range of that receiver uh, and the date and time and uh, any other information that was there. So this allows us to track any number of aquatic species, um, whether they be saltwater, freshwater, and the duration of these studies can go on from you know weeks and months to many years. As well, we maintain a, a global uh, database of IDs for data integrity reasons that allows us to sell these transmitters worldwide and wherever these tags go, uh, you're sure to know that that was your particular animal that might have been detected. So over the 40 years that we've been uh, developing these products, we've certainly seen a, a lot of change and a lot of development uh, from the early days and with electronics and miniaturization, we've been able to get to smaller and smaller tags and build uh, more and more sophisticated receivers as we uh, have, have been able to progress. So this kind of gives a, a quick snapshot of some of those developments. And today we're gonna predominantly focus around uh, the VR4 underwater, or, or touch on the VR4 underwater modem. When designing or, or planning a fish tracking acoustic telemetry study, there's a number of aspects that need to be considered. So. Some of those uh, pertain around active tracking versus passive monitoring. So active tracking is, is when you're actually physically there trying to follow animals uh, underwater that are, you know, that have been tagged versus passive monitoring where you may tag uh, a number of animals 
deploy receivers in areas of, that are of interest to you. Um, let those receivers collect data for a number of months, six months, 12 months, may, maybe several years. And then you collect that data and then analyze it and uh, determine, try and determine what was happening with those, the animals you were studying. You may also be considering uh, uh, things like residency or migratory studies. So a residency study would be where fish are maybe using a particular habitat and there may be large number of individuals that will come and go versus a migratory study where fish are either traveling down river or up river to spawn and you're looking at their movements or they may be coastal animals and you're looking at their their use of coastal uh, regions you know on an annual basis we can also look at fine scale positioning so if you want to know precisely where an animal was situated within an ecosystem you can do that uh, through triangulation and we can get to resolutions uh, on the order of meters or even submeters, and depending on the solutions used. Or conversely, you may just be interested in presence absence. Was the animal in that area or was he not there at that particular time? And so all of these things, the spatial scale is important, either in terms of the resolution, in terms of positioning, or how large an area that you're interested in studying uh, the animals in. So it could be a few square kilometers to, to a very small area. Uh, and the temporal scale is also important, both in terms of the resolution, in terms of how often you get an update for that particular animal. It could be every few minutes down to seconds, or you may be looking at studies that have durations of maybe a few weeks to, to several years. So in order to, to conduct these studies, the, the active, uh, fish tracking technology. We have uh, an active receiver, which we call the VR100. It has hydrophones, either omnidirectional or directional, and this sort of shows the frequency ranges that we're working in, sort of 51 kilohertz to 84 kilohertz, or up in the 180 kilohertz range. And in terms of transmitter technology, um, we initially started uh, in the early days with continuous tags. So these would be tags that each tag transmits on a different frequency. And so you're now tracking animals in, if you like, the frequency domain. And we have various sizes of tags. Um, the V9, nine millimeter tag, V13 is 13 millimeter, V16, 16 millimeter with sensors. And again, as you tag each animal, each animal is on a different frequency. That was somewhat limiting in terms of their only finite number of frequencies that we would use. And so in order to increase the number of animals that one could track at the same time, we developed a technology called coded tags. So now instead of using the frequency domain to differentiate the animals, we actually put all the animals on the same frequency and use the time domain. So we actually use uh, encoding schemes uh, such as pulse position modulation, where we can use a series of pings on a particular frequency and then decode those and extract the data. So that opened up the door to having many more uh, IDs for individuals to track and the size of those tags now ranges from seven millimeters to 16 millimeters and in terms of sensors we have temperature, we have uh, pressure and we also have uh, predation. The D is really for digestion so we can actually detect stomach acid and know when the animal that you've been, that you've tagged has actually been eaten by a larger animal and now you're tracking another animal, <laughs> which you don't really know who it is. Um, in terms of these coded tags, they exist on the six, nine kilohertz uh, range as well as the 180 kilohertz frequency and 180 kilohertz tags, because the frequency is higher, we're able to get to smaller resonators. So we're down to a V5, five millimeter tag, seven and nine. And again, temperature, pressure and predation. In terms of positioning with, these, with this technology, you're really limited to where the receiver was located uh, when the detection occurred. There's a GPS antenna built into that receiver and that tells you where you were on the planet when you detected that particular animal. With passive uh, fish tracking technology, uh, we've got 
a number of uh, receivers available. Some of them are just fully autonomous, the VR2W, W is for wireless, so it uses Bluetooth. So underwater, it's listening for acoustic signals, the tags, the coded tags. Once you get uh, pull it out of the water, you turn it into a Bluetooth device and offload your data. And we've got a mobile transceiver. We've got networked related receivers with cables to give you real-time capability. The VR4 underwater modem, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, VR4 Global, which uses an Iridium satellite connection, and our latest system, which is live, which is based on a cellular, give you, again, near real-time information about the presence of animals in your study area. And then we have autonomous transponding receivers with uh, the VR2TX, which has a transmitter built in with uh, sensors, as well as the acoustic release version, the VR2AR. And uh, those are available to again augment uh, and, and help uh, in the deployments. The transmitter technology here with passive is only coded tanks. There are no continuous tanks in use. And again, the technologies here are 69 kilohertz, various tag ranges, and we also have 180 kilohertz family as well, which I'm not touching on here. In terms of the positioning, we can do fine scale positioning analysis. Uh, there's software available to do that and services. And again, it's, it's allowing a detection to be picked up by three or more receivers in a location and then taking that data, analyzing it and triangulating back to where that tag was located between those transmitters, uh, receivers, sorry. So we have quite a diverse family of products, uh, as you can see. So from acoustic transmitters, acoustic receivers, hydrophones, uh, positioning in both 2D and 3D. A lot of the 3D is typically done using pressure sensors built onto the tag. And aqua measures is sort, certainly the latest uh, product that we've added. Uh, these are basically environmental loggers uh, that can also transmit to neighboring receivers that are looking at things like temperature, dissolved oxygen, salinity, turbidity, chlorophyll, blue, blue green, algae, uh, CDOM, FDOM, and so on. So increasingly what's becoming popular or important, I guess, is when you're studying animals in a particular ecosystem, they have environmental cues and knowing what the environmental factors are at that time is, is critical in, in understanding the animal behavior. So over the years, what's happened is the technology has been deployed by uh, grassroots researchers, uh, government scientists, and so on. And because of the nature of the technology and the fact that animals don't always do what we think they're gonna do, <laughs> they tend to travel larger distances than was anticipated, uh, networks started to get created where individual scientists would start sharing their data with each other, uh, sharing their receiver locations, and uh, sharing their detections. And so this led to these uh, groups that have sort of grown up, if you like, uh, across the globe. Uh, Pacific Ocean Shelf Tracking, our post, which is on the west coast of North America. Ocean Tracking Network, it's another one on the east coast here, um, and so on. So these networks have, have kind of driven a lot of the next generation of products that, that we uh, started to develop. So that brings us to the VR4 underwater modem. So a lot of those networks have coastal arrays where they're deploying receivers for long periods of time. And so the need was for a receiver that could basically be deployed uh, for you know, up to nine years potentially, depths up to 500 meters, and um, provide the ability to, to communicate with the surface so you don't actually have to pull it up. So we integrated into this product, the Teledyne uh, Benthos uh, Compact modem 9, 903 band C was integrated into the receiver. You can see that on the top. There's also two hydrophone towers there. There's a 69 kilohertz and 180 kilohertz tower. So they're able to detect tags that come in proximity. And then there's an external port as well. If you wanted sensors, there's an RS-232 external port that, that's accessible to the, into this unit as well. And it has the ability to store up to 800,000 detections. The way you would get your data is then you would take the universal deck box on the surface from a, a boat, ship, 
put the hydrophone in the water and offload the data through the water column. And this allows you to basically go out periodically, collect your data. And a lot of these have been uh, deployed by a number of those networks. Uh, looking at one particular case study in and around Australia. So they have a number of uh, receiver array lines that sort of uh, are located around the continent. Um, hundreds of research, 170 researchers and growing, I suspect. This information is a little bit dated. Uh, they've done over 2,000 deployments of receivers and, and offloads of data. And they're up to over 65 million and growing in terms of the detections of the, uh, of the database that they've started to gather for this. Here's some uh, examples of the VR4 underwater moorings on some of the lines, coastal lines, as well as one that was deployed uh, trying to get the exact details either outside the Sydney Harbor or uh, Bondi line and uh, around an artificial reef. So a lot of times reefs are put in to create new habitat for fish species and it's good to try to understand if the fish are actually using the habitat. So again you can monitor the reefs using these receivers and, and tagging animals on those reefs. So that's how uh, they were able to use the uh, VR4. Another example we have is the the ocean tracking network. Um, in this particular case, the Ocean Tracking Network uh, works globally. As you can see, uh, they have uh, lines uh, off of North America, Europe, Australia, uh, South Africa, and are working collaboratively with a lot of the other networks. In particular, they have a line of 166 receivers off of uh, Nova Scotia, Canada here in Halifax. Uh, that 166 receiver basically goes from the shore out to the shelf. It's a 132 kilometer line, one of the longest, I believe, in the world, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, after having sent uh, vessels and trying to get vessel time to go out and gather that data using the universal deck box, uh, they started to look at other solutions. And one of those was to use a wave glider with a tow body to actually go out and uh, sail that line and gather the data. So as a result of that work, um, we were involved with uh, Liquid Robotics at the time, I guess it's now Boeing, uh, to develop a tow body. And that tow body incorporated a uh, 69 kilohertz receiver, 180 kilohertz receiver, and the Benthos uh, modem. Sorry. Um, the, the tow body basically allows the um, wave glider to offload uh, VR4s as they come into proximity. So the modems start to communicate and we start to offload the data as the vehicle sort of uh, glides over the, <laughs> over the locations. And it's also able to detect tags uh, as it's transiting from station to station using the uh, onboard uh, uh, receivers. And that information is sent via cable to the platform on the surface and that then information can then be relayed back to the uh, satellite and back to the, to the organization. So this has been uh, deployed now a number of times across the Halifax line for gathering data and it's greatly reduced their offload time and it shows a tremendous promise in terms of reducing their data collection costs. They can actually have the, the wave glider growth several times a year and uh, are not limited to weather and, and uh, or pandemics. The glider just goes off, does its thing. We're now uh, into another project similar where we're working with uh, Teledyne Web Research uh, in integrating the uh, universal, uh, the modem into the, into the Slocum Glider. So again, in not all circumstances uh, are wave and wave energy available to, to send vehicles out. And so in some instances, having a, a Slocum glider solution would be advantageous, uh, particularly in the Great Lakes. And so we're actually working with the uh, University of Windsor and Teledyne and uh, looking at, again, deploying this technology into the Great Lakes and using uh, Slocum gliders to actually go station to station and offload the data that uh, is being collected by the VR4 underwater modems. So again, 
the goal here is to greatly reduce the data offload time and reduce the overall data collection costs for our, our uh, customers and scientists. And that's really uh, the talk. I'm now available for questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Richard. That was that was really interesting. And uh, Carl and I were just texting back and forth as we were both laughing. You never really thought about that you're tracking something that suddenly gets eaten, and now you're not quite sure what you're what you're actually tracking. So uh, yeah, that was that's interesting uh, problem. Uh, so we uh, are accepting any questions. If anyone has anything that they would like to ask, you can just type it in where you see the question bar um, on your dashboard there, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. And in addition to Richard, we also do have um, Carl Mancuso available for specific uh, technical questions on the modems. Um, so we'll just give everyone just a few seconds here, see if we've got anyone interested in getting some answers on some of these items. So a good point as well that uh, in your talk, Richard, that this is pandemic proof. Some of these uh, vehicles, autonomous vehicles getting out there, including the, uh, the gliders. It's an interesting concept that I'm hearing more and more about that, uh, you know, they just go to work every day. It doesn't really matter that they're out there. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they don't have to worry about social distancing and, and ship time and being in close proximity. You, you, save, you send these vehicles out. Um, obviously, they have to be deployed, but once they're deployed, then yeah, they can go out and do a lot of that work, uh, put, put less people in danger. Yeah, and that really is what it's all about at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Uh, okay, well, uh, that was just one of the many ways that Teledyne Benthos acoustic modems are being used around the globe, providing highly reliable acoustic communications for all types of applications. Uh, if you'd like any more information on anything uh, that is, was presented by Innova C today, uh, or information on any of our acoustic modems, if you've got an application in mind, uh, we would certainly like to hear from you. Please feel free to reach out to me and uh, we will have some additional information that will go out in the email uh, that will include the link to today's uh, recorded webinar. So I don't see any questions coming up here. So I think we are, oh, let's see, let me just make positive here if I get one more. Oh, wait, I take that back. Got some coming in. Um, Richard, uh, here you go. How do you connect the tag to a fish? Oh, that's a great question. So um, most of the tags are actually surgically implanted inside the fish. So uh, external attachments, you know, in the early days were done and uh, invariably uh, the fish would find a way to either rub it off, uh, remove the tag or it would get shed within a few weeks or months. So uh, the preferred method is actually to surgically implant them inside the fish so that uh, means there's, there's some surgery involved. So you catch a fish, you've got to anesthetize it uh, keep its water, uh, its gills aerated with water, and um, and and do surgery. So typically, it takes uh, a minute or two to uh, do the incision, insert the tag, and suture the fish. So you are tracking that individual, um, and then uh, you revive that fish and and release it. Some animals, that's a little trickier to do, particularly great white sharks. Not too many people are, are, are ready to go and do surgery on white, great white sharks. <laughs> but O-Search have, have come up with some interesting platforms. You may have seen them on, uh, on the YouTube and such. Um, and they tend to attach the tags externally. So they basically bolt it to, you know, when you've got a large animal like that, you can literally bolt it to the dorsal fin or attach it externally. The risk with external attachment, of course, is that the, the tag will get shed at some point. Uh, it'll either biofoul and, and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, generally surgically implanted, but we also have the option to externally attach um, the tags to, to, to the animals, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and I've got uh, two questions, uh, one from Steve and one from Peter, and they're both uh, asking about biofouling, which you just mentioned there, and, and how you cope with that on these devices. Uh, can you give a little information on that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a challenge for sure, and we're certainly looking for solutions to that, uh, particularly in shallow coastal areas where you know there's a lot more growth and so on. As you get into the deeper waters, uh, particularly where the VR4s, if they get into several hundreds of meters of water, 
<clears throat> doesn't tend to be so much of an issue for us, but uh, in the shallower uh, coastal, more prolific areas the, of the water column, the, the biofouling can be an issue. A lot of times the receivers you know, need to be serviced either you know, every six months or, or a year, depending again on, on the growth and, and concerns, but that's obviously uh, something that needs to be watched and, and is, is problematic. We have scientists that have tried uh, numbers of solutions, you know, anti-fouling paints and so on, but those are not always uh, environmentally friendly and, and are not uh, legislated in, in parts of the world, particularly Europe mm -hmm. and such. So um, different, uh, different solutions, but it's a challenge. There's no question, yeah, it is, that's a challenge. Yeah, I'm, so I'm not surprised that question came up because I think we all, we all deal with that in our, in our day to day. It's uh, just sort of an yeah. ongoing. Uh, ongoing issue. And uh, you actually answered the second part of Peter's question there regarding uh, periodic cleanings and so forth. So I know you touched on that. So uh, you actually got two for one on that answer there. Um, any, uh, I think that is it for our questions. Let me just make sure I'm not missing. Oh, nope, got another one. Um, oh, no, nope, same thing. Ask them about biofouling. <laughs> okay. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that is a, a concern for everybody on there. Uh, so, okay. Well, I. Oh, one more just came up here. Um, that's great. One from Hugo. Uh, how can um, uh, can we use an autonomous surface vehicle to track fish? Oh, good question. Autonomous, <clears throat> certainly. Um, we've sold a number of um, cabled receivers to to different organizations that have uh, attached them to vehicles, um, as well as VMTs, for example, on on slocums uh, have been used. So. Virtually any um, autonomous vehicle can be equipped with uh, with a receiver, uh, either cabled or, or fully autonomous, and it can collect uh, you know presence or absence of of tags in that in the vicinity. So uh, the other advantage or potential advantage of these uh, receivers, particularly those that are transponding, is you know periodically they emit a ping. So sometimes if a vehicle has gone missing, and we've we've had this happen where people have uh, had the vehicle go missing, shall we say, and were <laughs> able to relocate it because the pinger was uh, transmitting, and and they were able to uh, oh. narrow, zero in on back in on the on the vehicle. Yeah. So you can find fish and vehicles. Vehicle as opposed to a surface, but yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, well, uh, that is an interesting concept. We'll have to think about with our Ocean Science Z boat because we've got that autonomous platform that uh, hadn't really thought about that. That's interesting to go that route. Um, and let's see, here's another one. Is there, um, Joe Quinn's asking, is there a way to track animal movement in small areas? So he's saying, he's saying specifically like lobsters, and it can be done real time. Absolutely. So so we continue to innovate in that space, and um, you know we're getting into smaller and smaller tags, which have higher higher resident frequencies. So they have you know we're, we have a 307 kilohertz system that we're about to launch. Uh, we've got the 180 kilohertz, which uses smaller tags. And with these smaller tags, our spatial uh, ability to position spatially is is um, is quite good. I mean, we're well sub sub meter in terms of uh, spatial positioning of animals underwater. So in small areas, uh, we have some studies that we're collaborating with on uh, aquaculture facilities. So people know where the fish are; they're in the pen, or in some cases, they may be studying animals outside of pens. But again, looking at animal movement, animal behavior, a particular accelerometer tags on these animals and measuring energetics. So th this is all possible in, in fairly confined space. Uh, lobsters on the bottom, there's been a number of lobster studies. Those are external, of course, and, and smolting, the, the molting will, uh, will shed the tag, but at least you can study them for, for a period of time. Okay, great. Well, we've got more questions coming in. This is this is super. Uh, so Ivan is asking um, uh, the towed receiver, uh, the towing receiver. Is it a single hydrophone or an array? He's asking that to know if you can detect the bearing and elevation angles of tags and pings, specifically on the wave glider. So on the wave glider, yeah, no, it's not a, a towed array in any shape. I'll just get back to it. So it, it just has a, a, a tower. So it's an omnidirectional listening uh, receiver. 
and uh, there's really no bearing or range information per se that we can get. We can uh, at this time from from those um, from those receivers now. So there there isn't uh, that we. But that is something that is uh, being investigated. Yeah, well, <clears throat> we've got we can do range and bearings with the uh, modems using our DAT. So uh, we should mm. talk a little bit more about that. That's an interesting uh, idea, and might be something that we could collaborate on there as well. So um, yeah, good question, Ivan. Uh, another question: In your opinion, what's the best method for tracking large marine species such as right whales? Yeah, the right whales. That's a, that's another interesting problem. They they've been done using acoustics for short term, but again, the these tags, particularly 69 kilohertz, are are probably in their hearing range, um, and so it's not generally used on mammals or used on right whales uh, as such. And if they have been, I think Woods Hole has done some studies, but they were just you know a few days to a week kind of in duration, so they were active actively tracking them. Tracking uh, right whales is a challenge. Uh, I think sort of certainly the passive uh, acoustic monitoring, those that are using listening stations, uh, picking up the whale songs and, and hydrophones in the water is, uh, but attaching to whales is extremely challenging. Yeah, that's uh, that's not that's not an easy thing, and particularly you wouldn't want to do it with something that that was in their uh, in their auditory range. That's for sure. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And that's, you know, such a uh, species that really needs some protection right now mm. as, as well. So, uh, yeah, big problem that hopefully uh, someone can come up with a, a solution on that. I know we are doing some um, mammal monitoring with, uh, with, with customers using our gliders and hydrophones. Uh, but as you said, you know, they're not, yeah. not necessarily tagged. It's just listening for their unique um, tones. So uh, great question, Sarah. Um, and David is asking, how much data are you tracking uh, besides GPS and what type of bandwidth does a compact modems provide for this? So uh, in terms of uh, the, the compact modem, I believe we're running generally at around 1100 baud, so um, through the water column. When it comes to the tags transmitting, I mean, we're, our baud rate is, probably one <laughs> so we're <laughs> transmitting you know we're kind of like the zigbee of underwater we're very low low data rates uh we're sending sensor data you know updates maybe once every few minutes if if there's um uh sensor tags attached so so i i don't know if i'm answering the question but yeah generally the the, the acoustic telemetry um system that we have is, is very low baud rate and then of course once we get it into the VR4 we're able to uh, utilize the benthos modems uh, much higher bandwidth to to offload the data and you know we can typically get uh, receivers offloaded in in 15 to sort of 20 minutes again depending on the number of detections that are there but I don't know if that answers the question sure okay and and david if uh if you have anything further on that you know reach out to us and if, if we didn't answer fully answer that question for you we'll be happy to do that um okay uh david said thank you so i think we <laughs> i think we got him there i think that is it for the questions i know we're just running a little bit over here but uh that was great i am always excited to see questions at the end and i learn things every single time we host one of these events which is great uh, hopefully, all everyone in the audience today learned something as well. And Richard, we'd like to thank you very much for presenting and giving us your time today. It was a, a really great topic, so uh, thank you for that. Great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity. You bet. You bet. And uh, for everyone that attended, thank you so much for your time as well. I know everyone's time is incredibly valuable, and we appreciate you spending a little time with us today to learn more about this application. Uh, watch for the email with follow-up information. And as always, please do reach out if you um, would like any additional information. So uh, with that, everyone, please have a great day. Stay safe. And hopefully, we'll see you online again soon. Thanks a lot.